Now we're recording. Go ahead, Courtney. Okay, uh, just an overview of what I'll be uh, talking about today in the presentation. So what is recreation therapy? Um, I have a little video on here about seven steps to uh, stroke and recovery. I'm going to talk about body, mind, and spirit, what that means in um, approximately to leisure and recreation activities. Um, I'm going to get into adaptive sports and recreation. I'm going to talk about a new and exciting program called Walking Soccer and just sum it up into next steps and how you can take all this information and apply it out for yourself. There we go. What is recreation therapy? So also known as therapeutic recreation, um, is a process that utilizes functional interventions, leisure education, and recreation participation to enable persons with physical, cognitive, emotional, and or social limitations to acquire and or maintain the skills, knowledge, and behaviors that will allow them to enjoy their leisure optimally, function independently, with the least amount of assistance, and participate as fully as possible in society. So I know that's a mouthful, so I'm going to sum that up for you um, in simple terms, is recreation therapy, what we do is we want to find out what you like, what do you enjoy, and we want it to be meaningful and purposeful, so it's going to help improve your quality of life. We're going to look at ways to help to modify or adapt that activity that'll fit your, you know, a current ability. Um, we look at, you know, identify any barriers or challenges that you may face for participation, um, increasing social interactions, and as well as getting you back into the community and doing the things that you really enjoy. Turning to the next page. There it is. So this uh, seven steps to recovery, it's um, social interaction and recreation master. So my friend Kim McKenzie, she's a recreation therapist from Fraser Health, um, Health Authority, and she partnered with the Stroke Recovery Association for this uh, video. So um, I'm just going to put it on and I think it will give you an idea of recreation therapy and what you can do um, for yourself. Welcome to 7 Steps to Stroke Recovery. Hi, my name is Kim and I'm a recreation therapist. This short video will provide you with information and strategies on how to return to everyday life and things you enjoy after having a stroke. Remember, there is life after stroke. Every stroke and every person is different, so this video won't answer all your questions. What it will do is give you a starting point to answer some of the questions you may have. It may even spark a passion or curiosity you never knew you had. Recreation and leisure have the power to help you feel good about yourself. Whether it's structured recreation activities or simply spending time doing things you enjoy, we know that being active will help in the recovery process. Recreation and leisure can be just about any activity you enjoy, like an aquafit class or a walk in the park, meeting friends for coffee or volunteering, playing the guitar or writing stories, knitting, gardening or cooking, crosswords, reading, or meditating and attending temple or church. Choose something you'll enjoy. If you're motivated, enthusiastic, and satisfied with the activity, it's probably the right one for you. The activity that I like to do is I like to swim. As I think the water resistance really helps in getting my muscle control back. And sometimes I'll ride my longboard. Generally, I like to stay as active as I can because I think that's been a big part of my recovery. It's just keep trying to get back to the things I enjoy doing. There is life after stroke. And one way you can regain your life is choosing to be active. But you may be thinking, where do I start? I'm not sure if I can do that since my stroke. 
It's common after a stroke to feel frustrated about challenges to participating in activities. Here are some tips. The first thing to do is identify your interests. What do you like to do? Do you like to do things on your own or with other people? What do you do that really makes you smile and feel happy? Next, think about your current abilities and personal strengths. Make sure you consider all your abilities and strengths, including physical, emotional readiness and motivation, skills and interests, communication, and more. This will allow you to set realistic and achievable goals, laying the groundwork for enjoyable experiences. Uh, after a stroke, the first thing that is needed is that you need to accept that you've had a stroke. And once you accept it, then you can figure out a way to uh, move forward. Uh, start with small goals. Like for me, it was walking. That's the first thing that I wanted to do so I can get up and do things. But then after that is to get the strength back in my hands, to be able to carve again and cut vegetables. It seems mundane, but it's a really important thing to do. Next, consider adaptations. There are strategies, tools, and adaptations that can help you overcome challenges and pursue what you enjoy. For example, you can slow down the activity or break the activity into smaller steps, reduce the number of rules, or use tools and techniques to help with communication and memory. Use adaptive equipment. Here's some examples. Cuffs, larger print, or use a chair for seated exercise like yoga and resistance training. Build confidence by focusing on what you can do now. For example, if your goal is to swim, start with walking in the pool. Finally, think about what supports you have and what else you might need. It can really help to visualize the activity from start to finish before you try it. Let's say your goal is to join your friends at the local rec center. The first step might be to walk to the bus. By visualizing, you'd identify what supports you need to do this. For example, a walking aid or a place to sit on the way. Then you might add getting on the bus and traveling a few stops. Eventually, you'll build up to the full activity by setting yourself up for success by achieving a number of small goals. I use a couple of different tools because I do like to cook in the kitchen. I have a different uh, slab chops to help me because it's tough to cut with one hand. So being able to dice vegetables and even opening a can, an electric can opener has come a long way for me. When I, um, I had this stroke, and I couldn't talk. I didn't know my name. They said, do you know what her name? I, I didn't know what my name was. I couldn't s speak, so I had to... Write it down? Yes. Text. Well, at the start, we didn't know if she had comprehensions that the stove was on or the sink was filling. So I had her best friends. I flew them in from Edmonton. Every week I was at work and uh, every day because she had someone to talk to it was just progressing 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 it's amazing in three four days the difference just from socializing i mean it's it's a massive thing with lana for sure after a stroke it's not uncommon to feel a change in your ability or comfort level in social situations many people feel they have less interaction with other people or that the relationships have changed. Your family and friends might also feel their own emotions and social adjustment related to your stroke. The adjustment can be hard on everyone and can make social interactions difficult. Patience, yours and theirs is key. Behavior changes and emotional health can improve over time. The best way to start is to find people you enjoy interacting with and spend time with them doing things you enjoy. Start small, build up your socialization skills gradually. 
At the beginning, you might only be spending a few minutes at a time with others. Over time, this can grow as you continue to recover and improve. Here are some social interaction tips. Join a community stroke recovery program. Review the leisure guide for your local rec center. Invite a friend over for coffee or meet at a local coffee shop. Volunteer. With social interaction, the most important thing is to make the effort. When we were in the peer program, um, we had one person that really was down. And, you know, just by talking to her, you know, it seemed to help her, even though it only was 10 minutes at the time. And you didn't think you did much, but, you know, you did, did huge steps for her. Getting back into the community after stroke can be difficult and different for everyone. Be patient and figure out what supports work best for you and your loved ones. There are positive steps you can take to remain engaged and active in the community. Keep trying. Never give up. There is life after stroke. Thank you for watching this video. We at Stroke Recovery Association of BC hope that this information gives you a starting point for great conversations to come. A list of resources is available at www.srabc.ca. So I just want to summarize some of Kim's um, key points and tips that she was talking about. So number one, to identify your interests. So this is, you know, like, what are you passionate about? What do you like? What makes you happy? What are your interests, right? So you want to identify those. And then, then you want to identify your abilities and personal strengths. So you want to consider all your abilities. So that could be your physical ability, um, your readiness to engage in leisure and rack, your motivation, how motivated are you, your skills, interests, and communication. Next, you want to set some realistic and achievable goals. So it's always good to start with small goals. Um, then you want to consider if you need any ad adaptation. So that could be um, strategies, tools, or adaptations to overcome any challenges. So some examples are slowing down the activity, reducing the amount of rules required, or using tools or techniques to help with commun communication and memory. Um, some forms of adaptations may be using a chair, cuffs, or um, larger print like for reading. And then you want to identify your support. So what supports do you need? And in the video, it recommended that you visualize ahead of time what you need to be successful. So if you're visualizing, you know, the first step, what you need, and then going on from there. Eventually, you want to build up to the activity by setting small goals. Okay. So pathway to well. So when we're looking about activities we you know we want to incorporate a holistic approach to wellness right not just the physical not just emotional but you know like an all-encompassing um, a whole approach to to wellness so i just want to ask everyone here what activities are you currently doing that supports your quality of life what are you doing right now okay yeah. Yeah. Zumba at home through YouTube. Yeah. That and meditation and yoga. Perfect. It's great examples. Aquafit. That's another good one. Yeah. Getting in the pool. Swimming and running with a visual impairment. Perfect. Okay, those are all great examples. So I'm just going to go more into them. So break them down into a little bit more. So for body, we're talking about physical activity. You know, we're talking about um, or 
increasing our strength, our endurance, our balance, our cardiovascular. So some examples, of course, up there, riding a bike, swimming, badminton, curling. And of course, there's many more um, golf, soccer, tennis. You know, some of us even, uh, some of you even talked about some already, like running, um, aquafit, and yoga. So then we have mind. So this has to do with cognition. So stimulating your cognition, your memory, thinking skills, language skills, and our speech, right? So some activities we have are um, crossword puzzles, um, journaling, poetry, playing a musical instrument, knitting or crocheting, that type of thing. There's other, you could try something new, um, reading, learning a new dance, like a new choreography. And then for spirit, spirit is more connecting with yourself, connecting with nature, connecting with like a higher power, things that make you feel good inside, right? So for examples, I have our Tai Chi, uh, listening to music, yoga, meditation, or caring for animals. You could also have singing, volunteering, traveling, and even dancing. So I just want you to reflect a little bit on, you know, what activities are you currently doing to promote your quality of life? We also, we had some good examples mentioned here earlier. When you think about the activities you participate in, do you have a balance of body, mind, and spirit activities? Or are they mostly in one domain? For example, are they mostly physical or are they mostly cognitive? So it's nice to kind of mix it up every now and then and try something new in a, in a different domain. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to do it all right away. I mean, it could be once a month you try yoga class or, you know, seasonally, maybe you go and try um, meditation in the park in the summer, you know, and in winter it might be a different activity. So try and mix it up and have more of a, a balance of activities that you do, especially seasonal, because that might change a little bit. And how can you add more meaningful activities to increase your quality of life? You know, what, what things could you add to it to improve? And it doesn't have to be like I mentioned, you know, every day, it could just be something every now and then that you're trying that something new. So we talked a little bit about exploring leisure activities, but now I wanted to talk about adaptive activities. What are they and how can you participate? So adapted sports are any sport, hobby, or activity that is performed by someone with a disability using equipment specifically designed, modified, to allow the individual to do the activity that was previously not possible without this equipment or adaptation. So for an example would be using um, a chair for yoga. Um, it could be using um, any kind of equipment to help you in um, the activity. Um, say like in swimming, using a kickboard or a pool noodle to help you with flotation, right? Does anyone know of any ad adaptive um, sports or activities in the community or, or is anyone currently participating in any? Kayaking, yeah, I'm gonna get into that a little bit later, but it's great, you already know about that. Yeah, anyone else? To sail, yeah, yes. Yeah, for the Disabled Sailing Association, they have um, sailboats um, able for people to sail of all abilities, which is amazing. To tennis? To play? Right. Right, and that's a good point, um, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about later, but if you, wanting to return to a sport, there's ways to um, build up to that. And there's other sports that are transferable to 
build up to it, right? If you, it's the strength that you need. To, tennis rack is actually really heavy, but a ping pong paddle is quite light. And it, a lot of it, the skills are transferable. So for example, playing table tennis, um, practicing your hand-eye coordination and hitting the ball back and forth. Once you get better at that, then you can try something say like pickleball, which is in the middle, which is a combination of tennis, table tennis, and badminton. So it plays with a paddle and a smaller court, same like similar to tennis. So practicing that and then eventually um, can getting back into tennis. So there's little steps that you can go about that. So these are just some examples of adaptive sports. So in the top corner there, um, this man is doing Ai Chi. So Ai Chi is a form of Tai Chi, but it's in the water. So it's slow movements, uh, focuses on balance, breath work, flexibility. Um, this is actually held at Stan Strong Pool. Does everyone know where Stan Strong Pool is? So it's a therapeutic pool. Um, it's on 50, 59th and Canby, and it's a warm pool. So it's not as shocking when you get into our community pools, which are actually quite cold. This one's actually really warm. So they call it a therapeutic pool. And they offer this class on Fridays at 9.30. And it's half an hour. It's nice slow movements that you can do to increase your balance and coordination. Very tranquil. They have nice, beautiful... Um, nature sounds, no talking, very meditative. So it's, a, it's an actually really good exercise or activity. Um, the one in the top center, so this man is doing adaptive um, stand-up paddle boarding. So you can see he's actually on a wheelchair. <laughs> he's not standing up. So um, BC Moss, which this gentleman over here talked about, is actually located just down here um, Boss Creek just outside and they do adaptive kayaking and adaptive paddle boarding. However, they have platoons that go out on either side of the paddle board or kayak to increase stability so you won't tip over. This one um, looks a little bit <laughs> unstable, a little more risky, but they do have platoons and they use a double kayak so it's nearly Tippable, like in tippable, like you can't, <laughs> you can't tip it, believe me. Um, but BC Moss, um, this man is in the far left top corner or right. He's uh, golfing, so adapted golfing. So he has a little golf cart that where the seat actually swings out, so he doesn't have to stand. He can sit and still putt. And there's other forms of adapted golfing as well, but. Um, that one is pretty unique. Um, the bottom left, that's pickleball, which I was talking about earlier. So it uses a, a wooden sort of paddle. It's played on similar as a tennis court, but the court size is a lot smaller. So there's less area to cover. And it uses like, um, like a wiffle ball in a way. So it's um, really light ball and it's easy to hit. Um, bottom center, this woman is doing chair yoga. So it's just one pose in chair yoga. So you, normally you're sitting or using the chair to do exercises or poses. And in the bottom right, these two gentlemen are supposed to be doing a walking soccer, <laughs> which I'll get to um, talk about a little bit. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what is out there. So these are all adaptive sports and recreation the whole guide to what's available in BC. Lots of programming for people of all abilities and all ages. Um, the ones that are underlined, I don't think you can see it because I can barely see it from up there. Um, so things that I refer clients to who have had a stroke um, are adaptive yoga, BC Mobility Opportunity Society, so that's BC Moss, just down there. Disabled sailing, which was already mentioned. Um, power to be adventure, so they do adaptive um, outdoor recreation such as kayaking, camping, rock climbing, Southlands therapeutic riding, so for horseback riding, Dan Strong Pool, which I already talked about. There's Vancouver Adaptive Music Society, so that's located at GF Strong in the basement. 
and that's for anyone who wants to learn how to play musical instruments such as a guitar or piano and they are able to do some music lessons as well. Vancouver Adapted Snow Sports, so that's Bass, that's located on our North Shore Mountains and they do skiing and snowboarding for those um, interested in the winter. And I think that's about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so walking soccer. So this has been a, a personal project of mine, a personal passion project of mine that um, I've been working on a lot. So it was actually, um, the idea came up from a client actually who was from England and talked about how much he really enjoyed soccer but was not able to run anymore. So he mentioned that, you know, there is walking soccer and I was just blown away because I didn't even know it existed. And lo and behold, there was a small community that was actually um, taking part out in Port Moody of a bunch of um, older men who not necessarily have disabilities, but just couldn't run anymore, maybe because of um, maybe like a ankle injuries or knee or hip. Um, so older adults and they get together and play twice a week and go out and socialize afterwards. So I looked more into it and started a program up at GF Strong and then working to get this actually out in the community now. So I'll tell you a little bit about where you can play, but first I just wanted to show you how a traditional sport can be adapted. So for rules, so I'm not quite sure, does most of you understand the rules of soccer? Yeah, it's kind of, most of us had played as a child growing up in school or some of uh, our recreation team. Um, so for walking soccer, there's no offside. So any player can be on anywhere in the court. You're not gonna get called out for that. There's no heading of the ball because obviously for acquired brain injury, you don't wanna cause any more trauma or damage to our head. So that, that way all balls need to be kicked below the waist. And of course, no running. So you must walk, you must have one foot on the ground at all times. So adaptions and modifications were made. So it can be played in the gym, but it can also be played outdoors on a turf field. So the artificial turf, so it's nice and flat. Grass fields can kind of get like moderation and divots and that can be tripping hazards, which isn't good. We usually play three to five players per side. So depending on how big the gym space is, we try to keep it uh, smaller numbers. We use a low dense Nerf ball. So if you think of a tennis ball, but blow it up to soccer ball size. So it's supposed to be a low, low bounce because of that, it's played indoors. We play the balls off the side walls. So that's, those are playable, except at the end lines. When the ball is kicked out past the goalie net, then it's either a corner kick or the goalie will kick it back in. And then sometimes we play with a goalie and sometimes we don't. It's up to uh, the team, the players, if they feel like if we don't have enough players, maybe we won't use a goalie, but um, that's sort of optional. So I have some actual footage here of some of our participants playing at um, GF Strong, so I really hope this will play. <laughs> oh, and it's upside down, wow. Okay. Uh, how is that possible? <laughs> oh my gosh, seriously. If I turn the <laughs> laptop <laughs> upside down. Okay, so you can see he's kind of kicking it off the side of the wall. I have two participants who are using an activator pole, so poles are allowed as well to be used. Um, it's supposed to be just for stability and balance, not they can't use it to, to hit the ball or guide it. So, oh, that's so interesting. So where can I play? So currently, um, All Bodies Community Fitness Group is offering Learn to Play for the months of May and June. So they play Thursdays at 5.45 to 6.45 at Hillcrest Community Center. Um, lots of fun, I'm actually volunteering with them on Thursday nights there. 
Killarney Community Center will be offering workshops in August and um, they'll be implementing walking soccer into their fall leisure guide. So keep an eye out for that. BC Old Timer Soccer Association in Port Moody. So they play Wednesdays and Fridays, 11.45 to 1.00. Or one o'clock at the Port Moody Recreation Complex. So sometimes they'll play out on the turf field and sometimes they'll play indoors if you know the weather's not too nice or it's too cold, but mostly they'll play outdoors. They actually have a larger group, so sometimes they have about nine per side, nine or ten per side. So it's a larger group. Um, GF Strong Rehab Center. So we play in the gym there and you must be referred to the program. And there's more opportunities coming in the future. I've reached out to more community centers, just waiting to hear back from them, like Coquitlam, uh, North Vancouver, and I think another community center in Vancouver. So, yeah. Okay, so next step. So went over a lot um, in this PowerPoint, a um, lot of information here. So I just wanted to give you some takeaway, what you can take away, what's your next action step, something that you can do. Um, after leaving this presentation. So, you know, one thing you can do is just try to have one meaningful activity per day, whether that's going for a walk, uh, playing your musical instrument, you know, knitting, crocheting, make sure it's something meaningful to you, something purposeful, something you really enjoy, right? The next step, you might want to try something new, you know, like I, we've talked about a lot of different activities up there. Some you may have heard of, some you might have done in the past, but maybe you want to try again. Um, so just get out there and try something new. Um, you don't have to go out. Um, YouTube offers a lot of things. If you want to try a chair yoga, you can do it at home. But I think it's just, just try something different, something new. And the third step would be to join a club, to register for a class, to more participate in the community, to sign up for something. So if you know you wanted to try chair yoga, um, it's something new, maybe you try a drop-in class, and then eventually maybe you want to get a membership or sign up for a class through the leisure guide. And this is just a quote I just liked. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, coming out today. I really appreciate, I'm really honored to be here today to talk about leisure and sport. And um, if you have any other questions for me about how to engage in the community, I have a quick little tip shape and um, resource sheet on community resources, community centers, and just some web links here that's up front if you want um, to take that home with you. And I'll also send a copy to Jill that she can circulate as well. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? So the, the question was about VAS, Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sport, and a um, person doesn't need any adaptations but wants to return to skiing. And um, yes, Vancouver Adaptive Sports does offer um, sort of ski lessons or anything that if you want to sign up, they can do sort of like a one-time sort of assessment or just to see where you are, what your ability is, and just to increase your confidence on, um, on the snow. I actually just volunteered with them this past winter for snowboarding. I was teaching snowboarding, and they do offer, yeah, a lot of you know, lessons and stuff for people who just kind of want that one-time push to get out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're going to be opening. You want to keep an eye on for that around November, December is when they're going to start to, you know, send out more information on when, um, when you know, when the mountain starts to open and when they start to open for registration and stuff. You can also contact the executive director and you know get more information that way yeah and it, it totally depends on the person too like i took a client skiing this past um this past winter with the same thing like wanted to get back into skiing was unsure about balance and everything and it worked out perfect he was actually a better skier than me <laughs> it was pretty bad um but yeah like it that's definitely possible so the question is about groups for running or cycling with a visual impairment. Um, that's a good question. I know there is sometimes gaps 
in the community of what's being offered. Um, I think it's, did you, have you gone through, is it the BC Blind Association? BC Blind Sports, BC Blind yeah. Sports. yeah. Um, biking is a hard thing because there isn't really much in the community. So I think, if you were to return to cycling, you want to be obviously as visible as possible, you know, wearing reflective colorful gear. Sometimes people use um, like a flagpole in the back so they're, they're, you know, noticeable so cars can, you know, see the flagpole. And sticking to bike paths, you know, safe bike paths, um, staying off the road sort of from traffic and yeah, sort of taking your time that kind of thing. There is no real, unfortunately, groups for that. I wish there was. For running, there is a lot of running clubs and running groups, like um, Peninsula Runners does a running group. Um, so you can always join a running group and running in numbers is a little bit safer too. And I think, I don't know if you prefer to run on your own or with a partner, sometimes it's good to go with someone, you know, as an extra set of eyes, that kind of thing. Or maybe a buffer, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Do it. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. You so much,